Okay, thank you very much. Um, that fidgety thing took Amir about three weeks to do, so he's going to be very, very upset. That was the highlight of the conference. Um, I'm Brian Davidson. I'm, <laughs> I'm one of the transplant surgeons here, a liver transplant surgeon, uh, and I've been asked within 10 minutes to cover the whole topic of progress in transplantation, organ donation, and research. So um, it's going to be fairly superficial, uh, and it's going to be highly opinionated. Uh, just bear with me, please. Um, it's been said that organ transplantation is perhaps the greatest achievement of the 20th century, and when you, when you do ponder on the subject, I think that that may well be the case. Um, I tried to sell that to my kids, and I'm afraid uh, this came out in front of transplantation, but clearly transplantation must be up there as one of the great achievements for man in the 20th century. And just one a little bit of background information about when these things started out, uh, just so that we can put our thoughts for today into context, uh, we're really not talking about very far back when we had the very first procedures. It's suggested that 1933 was the first renal transplant, and that was done uh, without any understanding of, of organ rejection, and not surprisingly, the organ failed within, within minutes. And it was only when uh, some twins uh, were actually transplanted that obviously didn't have the problems with the immunological barrier that there was actually a successful outcome in transplantation, and that was in the early 1950s. And that preempted really the understanding of, of what organ rejection was all about, and uh, it's attributed to Peter Medawar uh, for his work in the 60s uh, to understand the subject of transplantation, uh, immunological rejection, and put in the strategies that we've seen to prevent organ rejection. And in the early 60s, that was followed by the first uh, human liver transplant. And as a liver transplant surgeon, I'm quite uh, overwhelmed when I see this. This is the uh, activity of liver transplantation in Europe. And you can see 1963 is down, 1968 is down in this corner. And there were virtually no transplants carried out in Europe uh, in the 70s and, and the early 80s. And you can see now we have about 6,000 transplants being carried out annually in Europe. And that absolutely phenomenal success rate uh, of liver transplantation was because the results progressively improved over the last 30 or 40 years. Uh, you can see again, this is the European transplant registry results. Uh, we've got outcomes here by uh, time period after transplantation. And this data is split into two cohorts. Uh, one cohort uh, being here in the 70s and 80s, and the most recent cohort in the 80s and 90s, uh, and into 2000. And you can see that the transplantation results have progressively improved, and very rapidly too. And it's not just been in Europe that we've seen improvements in organ transplantation. This is the UK data, uh, and this is the UK data separated into cohorts of three-year periods, uh, and this is 10-year outcomes. And you can see that there's been progressive improvement in the outcomes of transplantation. This is liver transplantation. Uh, you can see that there's now um, over 90% one-year survival in liver transplantation. And similarly with kidney transplantation, I see my colleague Bimby in the audience, of course, kidneys, he tells me, do far better than livers. And he's absolutely right in that you can see that the outcomes with renal transplantation are even better. Phenomenal success with over 90% one-year uh, graft in patient survival and again progressive <coughs> improvement uh, over the last two decades. And that success has all uh, been due to a variety of things. The first thing, obviously, is, is proper transplant immunosuppression. Uh, back in the 60s, when transplants were started out, the transplantation drugs were very limited. Uh, but cyclosporin, really brought in in the mid-70s, has been the mainstay uh, of transplantation immunosuppression. And only recently, we have we had a few other smarties in the bag that can be combined to try and improve further the outcome uh, of organ transplantation. But perhaps we uh, shouldn't dwell on what's been there in the past because we have to look forward. And looking forward, we probably want to avoid immunosuppressive drugs. And we want to get our organ transplant patients uh, to be tolerant of the organ so that we can take all immunosuppression off. Immunosuppressive drugs damage other organs. And really, in the long term, we want an 
an immunosuppressant-free protocol. And I just pulled out for interest this very recent paper where this has been achieved in renal transplantation. And this is perhaps what we'll be looking at in the next decade, is these very complex ways of modifying both the donor and recipient to tolerate the organs. Uh, just to give you a very brief outline, this was a small study based on eight patients undergoing live donor renal transplantation. Uh, the recipient was conditioned by giving them a short course of chemotherapy and then total body radiation. They then had a stem cell transplant. They then had their kidney transplant. And shortly after the kidney transplant, they had uh, again some stem cell uh, transplant with uh, facilitating cell enrichment uh, along with some T cells. Uh, and they all were discharged in their third post-operative day and the vast majority of these patients are completely free of immunosuppression, so they are, have full immunological tolerance. It's a complex procedure, but obviously it can be achieved, and I think clearly this is what we're going to be dealing with over subsequent years. The other major hurdle has been preserving organs, uh, and I'll just very briefly mention two advances. One is in the use of preservation solutions. Uh, University of Wisconsin solution in the late 80s revolutionized liver transplantation. Uh, but really, we've seen very little progress, really because it's so difficult to market a new transplant solution because the transplantation results already are excellent. And therefore, there's concern always to introduce something new uh, without extensive trialing. And then machine perfusion, the concept of trying to store the transplant organ in a better condition or actually even improve the condition of the organ during that time period between retrieval and implantation. It's already been shown to be satisfactory for the kidney and we and others are doing work on the liver. But all these things taken together is clearly not quite good enough. This uh, is again UK transplant data over a 10 year period down here. And you can see the number of patients waiting for transplantation at the top and the number of patients actually transplanted down here. And you can see that there's this huge gap between the need and what's actually available. And many of these transplants are actually not um, cadaveric transplants. These are live donor transplants in here. And Adrian Bailey commented on the fact that perhaps one of the things that would be most useful would be to has change the concept of, of donation uh, and the whole system for donation. And this is just showing you that in different countries in Europe, there's an enormous difference between the organ donation rates. And you can see Spain, uh, which takes the lead right up at the top here, uh, and the UK is down somewhere here. Yes, Britain in here. We have about half the donation rate of Spain, and I think further in this meeting we'll be discussing some of the reasons behind this. Surgeons like to innovate, and some of the surgical things have been done to try and improve organ uh, availability for transplantation. Um, I don't think that these have really made a remarkable dent on the requirement for organ transplantation, but innovation is good and innovation can be developed. Uh, first of all, there's the concept of splitting organs for transplantation, and it's quite straightforward to split the liver because it really has a unilateral uh, blood supply. So you can use the small left portion of the liver for a child's transplant and the big right lobe of the liver for an adult transplantation. So you get two organ donations out of one liver. And the other uh, big development is live donor transplantation, which has really maintained uh, renal transplantation activity at the level it is because uh, there's now far more uh, live donor transplants in the kidney than there is cadaveric transplants. And that's taken on because of the improved techniques for retrieving the, uh, the kidney from the healthy donor, uh, showing that it can be done very safely and effectively. But we have a big problem in the liver because removing sufficient liver for transplantation involves, in the majority of cases, removing the right lobe of the liver, which is certainly not a small operation and it's certainly not one without risk of morbidity and also potential mortality in the donors. And as you know, there's been some very um, publicized cases where the donor has died after donation of the right lobe of the liver. 
So one of the other areas that have been expanded uh, and ha is expanding rapidly is the use of non-heart-beating donors. And for those of you that are not um, familiar with this concept or, or donation after cardiac death, uh, these are organs that have come from patients where the there's been a decision made to withdraw life support and the organs are retrieved uh, after the heart stops. And this has been a, a big source uh, of donor organs huge opportunity, but there has been a price to pay, and the price being paid is that these patients have a prolonged period of hypotension, low blood pressure, and low oxygen supply during the time period that they are, are, their support is withdrawn, and these produce very marginal graphs. They might work, but they might not. They certainly have far higher incidence of complications and also problems that we see only very rarely uh, with a brain-dead donor. And if we use these non-heart-beating donor organs, you can see that the outcomes are poorer. Uh, if you compare this with the slide I showed earlier, you can see we're dipping down with uh, survivals uh, at 80 or 70%. This is kidney, kidneys from non-heart-beating donors. And it's exactly the same message from livers from non-heart-beating donors, where the results are significantly worse than organs that have been retrieved from somebody that's brain dead. So it has maintained our supply of donor organs, but at a very significant price. And this is obviously of some concern when you look at the big picture in the UK, because this slide shows the big picture of what's happening. Uh, these are living donors, and this is over the last 10 years, and you can see the number of living donors has increased enormously, with risk to the donor, obviously. Uh, the non-heart-beating donors, the, the donors after cardiac death, uh, you can see have, have um, sorry, that's this dark blue, have increased progressively, and these are relatively poor quality organs. And the good quality organs from brain-dead donors have actually dipped down over this period of time. So we have had the um, situation where we've maintained transplantation activity at the cost of poor quality organs. So I think that that uh, background really gives you some idea of where I think that we have to go in the way of challenges uh, now and for the future. I, I think that we have to accept that we have to reduce the risks for live donors by every means possible, and there are many means to do that, some of which we'll discuss today. I think that we are using more and more marginal graphs where they're not going to function as well or as quickly as before. And we have to have strategies to try and improve those organs or certainly make sure that they don't deteriorate further. And one opportunity is to try and improve the organ between the time of retrieval and transplantation, whether that's by perfusing it through a machine or conditioning the organ. And we're going to hear shortly from Sarah about how you can do organ conditioning, which is one of our research interests. And you can use pharmacological strategies as well to try and to mop up the, the damaging molecules during the preservation period. We'll see more about mi mi minimizing immunosuppression because the immunosuppressive drugs are damaging to the body. <coughs> uh, and clearly, the best way of doing that is to produce tolerance. Uh, and the small series that I showed on the kidney, uh, I think, marks the way ahead of how we're going to produce tolerance in our transplant recipients. It's going to be complex. It's going to be expensive but I think that that's going to be the way we're going to go. And then lastly, we're going to hear something today uh, about the options to try and fill the gap of the shortage of organs, either by the use of animal organs or tissue engineering organs de nouveau. Thank you very much indeed.